Psalm 137 in your Bibles tonight. Verse number 1, the Bible says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse number 4, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Singing does something good for the spirit of man. Researchers have discovered that singing is like an infusion of the perfect tranquilizer, the kind that both soothes your nerves and elevates your spirit at the same time. The elation may come from endorphins, a hormone that is released by singing, which is associated with pleasure. The neuroscience of singing shows that when we sing, our neurotransmitters connect in new and different ways. It fires up the right temporal lobe of the brain, releasing endorphins that make us smarter, healthier, happier, and more creative. When we sing with other people, this, is, this effect is amplified. Now, to be cautious, music can be and often is one of the most self-centered areas of ministry work, or if I could say religion. Music is a very important ministry. It's one of the most intensely spiritual Worshiping ministries in the church today, it's valuable, it's a blessing, it's powerful, and it's quite useful. It is especially wonderful to find godly singers or musicians who have been with God and have a special touch upon them as they sing His praises and unite the hearts of God's people together in music. The music ministry cannot be about personality and performance. It must be measured by the sincere worship of the heart. I'm going to repeat that. Music and the music ministry cannot be about personality and performance. It must be measured by the sincere worship of the heart. But when men and women with musical talent uh, couple that with the fact that they have an ability and a desire to glorify God with all of their hearts, true impact is made. But whether on the church stage or in the car walking down the street or working on the job, Christians have a song to sing. You know, I'm not especially talking about singing audibly. I'm speaking of what the psalmist said in Psalm 43. He said, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. It's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 through 20, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in Colossians 3, 16, Paul said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 1 Chronicles 6, 32, the Bible says, They ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation with singing. Tonight, I want to talk to you about this subject. God wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing. Over in 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, Jehoshaphat, one of the righteous kings of Judah, was about to face a battle. And in verse 3, the Bible says, Jehoshaphat feared and he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, thus saith the Lord unto you. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head to the ground with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Verses 20 through 22 of Second Chronicles 20, the Bible says, They rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, and ye shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Watch this. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. As they began to sing, 
as they begin to praise, as they begin to worship before the battle, that's when God set ambushments against their enemy. That's when God stopped their enemy. It's a foreign thing for many people to praise the Lord before the battle. Most people only want to praise God after the battle, if all goes according to plan. Jehoshaphat wanted to praise the Lord before he even faced the enemy. He was willing to accept God's will no matter what. Israel didn't plan on losing. They knew how great their God was, and they would fight according to God's plan. And in that text, we find out what happens when God's people sing. It's worth repeating tonight, not when you only praise Him for what He does after the battle, but if you learn to praise Him before the battle, if you'll learn to praise Him in the battle, if you'll learn to praise Him for the battle, and you'll learn to praise Him after the battle. God, I lift up your voice and give you a song in your heart. It might be that you're in a prison of suffering tonight. You may yet be in a prison with your back against the wall. You may be thinking tonight, I've lost my song. Just like in Psalm 137, we read about the children of Israel. They thought, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? When my back's against the wall, when I feel like I'm in prison, when I feel like my world's turned upside down, it's as if the world's jerked the song right out of my heart. I don't see a reason to sing. And with battles coming my way, with obstacles approaching me, with trials down the path, I see a storm on the horizon. How in the world can I sing a praise to God? But God wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing before the battle. God wants to hear you sing while you're in the battle. God wants to hear you sing and praise Him for the battle. And when that battle comes, then you'll be able to praise Him after the battle. If you learn to praise Him at all of those times, the next time you find another battle, next time you face another trial, the next time you face another storm, it won't be so hard to sing His praises before it arrives. Over in Psalm 22, verse 3, I love this text. The Bible says, But thou art holy... O oh, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Inhabitest. The word inhabitest means to sit down. You need to get that in your mind tonight. We want God to inhabit the praises. What that means that God, when he hears his children start to sing his praises, when he hears his children start to glorify his name, when he hears his people get to the altar and start giving him glory and start giving him worship, he inhabits that. That means he takes a seat. He gets in the audience. He pulls up a chair and says, I like that. I'll listen to that for a while. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about a popularity contest. It's not about getting in and seeing who can shine the brightest and sing the loudest and shout the greatest or serve the longest. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus. And God says, I'll sit down and I'll stay a little while for that. Every Sunday morning and every Sunday night we come into the house of God. Every Wednesday night we ought to ask the Lord, Lord, please inhabit the praise tonight. Every song that I sing, every note that's played, every prayer that I pray, every sermon that's preached, God inhabit the praise. Sit down a little while with us, Lord. Sit down a little while and stay with us. Pull up a seat right next to me, Jesus. I want to know that you're here. I, I like people being here. Hey, we run bus routes to try to get people here. We make phone calls to try to get people here. We send cards and letters and emails and inboxes, and we beg people to come. But I'd much rather have Jesus in this place where two or three people are gathered together. I want him to inhabit the praise. And I guarantee you nothing to do our pastor's heart any better, nothing to do our church any better, nothing to do your heart any better when God sits down a while in the congregation and inhabits the praise of his people. You think next time I don't feel like singing. I don't have a song to sing. Just remember God inhabits the praise. Even when your back's against the wall. Even when you're in a prison of suffering. You keep your faith on the Savior. That's where it comes in. You add from the prison of suffering. You add the praise of the believer. That's a recipe for the power of God. If you want the power of God, you've got to praise Him in the storm. You've got to thank Him in the trial. You've got to thank Him when it's dark. You've got to worship Him when you don't feel like worshiping Him. You don't worship Him because you feel good. You don't worship Him because... Because he's just been good to you. You worship him because of who he is. And that's all that really matters. God wants to hear you sing. God works when you sing. Don't forget that the forces of heaven are moved. When God's people begin to sing and glorify their master. Judah didn't know what to do in 2 Chronicles 20. Jehaziel stepped up and said, hey, you don't have to do anything. Praise him. Worship him. Sing to him. And he'll take care of everything else. It sounds ridiculous for us to praise God when we're in the battle. It sounds ridiculous for us to sing a song when our back's against the wall. But sometimes you just got to sing yourself out of a trial. Sometimes you've just got to sing yourself through a storm. Sometimes you've just got to, even if it's you're crying through it or mumbling through it, and your heart's in the right direction, you just say, Lord, I can't sing much, but I'm just going to do my best and I'm going to sing because I know you want to hear me sing. 
for a couple times in my life. One specifically some years back when I got discouraged and I got blue. And I remember going, it was in the middle of winter and I went out on my porch. And I took a quilt outside and sat on the porch in my rocking chair. And I just began to sing till the storm passes by. And I sing it over and over. Not loud, the neighbors didn't hear me. My wife didn't hear me. But I just sang it over and over and over. And little phrases stick out in that song. And that one specific phrase, hold me fast. Hold me fast. And I said, Lord, I'm going through something right now. And all I know what to do is I'm going to sing. I'm just going to sing it out. God wants to hear you sing. The enemies of God were smitten in 2 Chronicles 20. And as soon as Judah showed up on the battlefield, all they found were bodies scattered everywhere. And God's people reaped the blessing because of their recital to God. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 25. The Bible says, When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spool of them, they found among them in abundance both riches and precious jewels, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. More than they could carry away. Just because they praised God before a battle, God blessed them to the point they couldn't even carry the spoils away. Here's what I want to say to you tonight. If you'll get carried away with God, God will allow you to carry away more than you can handle. If you'll get carried away with Jesus, get wrapped up in Him, get excited about Him, Get your mind off of the things of the world. I'm not here tonight to sing to a car. I'm not here tonight to sing to a house. I'm not here to sing to a bank account. I'm not here to worship my popularity. I'm not here to worship my ability. I'm not here to praise my parents. I'm not here to praise a church. I'm here to praise the name which is above every name. The name of Jesus. He's the one who loved me when I was unlovable. He's the one who redeemed me when I was unredeemable. He's the one who gave me a song in my mouth, a song in my heart and mouth, uh, praise in my mouth. God wants to hear you sing. He'll fill your cup. He'll fill you up to the brim. Now look, it don't come in Sunday morning and tell the choir director, let me sing a solo today because God wants to hear me sing. God might want to hear you sing, but we don't. Spare us, spare us the pain. Spare us the aches in our ears. Sing in your car. Sing in the shower. I don't care. God wants to hear you sing, but maybe some of you might just need to stay where you're at in the pew and sing under your breath. But look it, you don't have to be in the choir. You don't have to be on the stage. Now that, that's important. And those things really matter. And those things are really important. Let me tell you something, choir. If you are in the choir, be filled with God when you get in the choir. The audience knows whether or not we are. Audience, be filled with God when you're in the audience because we know whether or not you are. Do you realize some of the greatest times in the choir is when we're looking at you? And you're singing alone. Some of the young children we sing mouthing every word of the song. Praising God. Somebody raising their hand. Somebody crying at a specific song. And we just kind of work off of each other. But then you go back to Psalm 137. As we open the text, the children of Israel had their back against the wall. They were in a prison of suffering. They were in captivity. They found themselves sitting down in discouragement by the rivers of Babylon. Now, they would have gladly exchanged these mighty rivers in this strange land for the humble river Jordan. No doubt the rivers of Babylon were great, but here they were led into captivity. So they sat down thinking that all was over, that all of their hopes were gone. Now, they were there because they rebelled and disobeyed against God. And so they were getting what was coming to them. But they were still God's people. God still loved them. God still had something for them. They had been marched northward and eastward, mile after weary mile. And it was from this very land that God had even called Abraham out hundreds of years before. And it's as if the children of Israel just made one circle, one wasted journey. They were back where they started. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before that you, you try to serve God or maybe you made some mess ups along the way and some, had some obstacles and had some hiccups and you find yourself in a prison of suffering and you think, God, I'm right back where I started. I take two steps forward and three steps back. And you start to lose your song. You start to lose your joy. You start to think, I don't have a reason to sing. I don't have a reason to testify. I don't have a reason to worship God. I don't have a reason to read my Bible. I don't have a reason to pray. I don't have a reason to witness to anybody. I have no joy in my heart. So they sat down thinking that God was done. Rivers of Babylon marked the end of their long and wasted journey. There was no place else they could go. And the Bible says that they wept when they remembered Zion. They began to think of the good old days. They began to think of the good times with God. They began thinking of the great worship times with God and, and, and what God had done for them. And the Bible says in verse 2, We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. 
You might be familiar with weeping willows. They grow near water to a considerable height and let down long leafy streamers. They're droopy looking little trees with an air of sadness about them. It's very interesting that, that God would put this in the Bible. So, you know, metaphorically speaking, they hung their harps on the willows even if they did for real. But the, the point is, is they just didn't feel like they had a reason to play. Didn't have a reason to sing. Didn't have any joy in their land of captivity. It had cost them dearly. And the Bible says in verse 3, For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. Our captives are now asking us to sing. Our captives, our enemies, the ones that are causing us heartache are, are mocking us and making fun of us. Say, hey, won't you sing us one of those songs? Won't you pull out your hymn book? You, you know, you brag on Jesus all the time and how good God is and now you're in trouble and you're, you're in a prison of suffering. Why don't you say something good about Jesus? Say something good about God. Sing us one of your songs. Sing us one of your hymns. Let's see some melody in your heart. Let's see a smile on your face. I'm sure you felt that way, the prodding of the enemy mocking you about your song, teasing you to sing a song of triumph. When you're wallowing in a bed of tears, you can hear the jeers and the laughter bathe in a tone of irreverence. If you, if you go back and study history, most of the songs of Israel at that time were songs of conquest and victory. So that they were in captivity and their enemies were asking them to sing a song of Zion, sing a song of conquest. They had just been conquered and now their enemy saying, hey, you're the ones with victory. You're the ones with, with God in your heart. You're the one with the God on your side. Sing us one of those songs. But the world cannot require a spiritual song from us. The world cannot rejoice in a spiritual song, and they cannot respect our songs. The world has mocked our singing. The devil has talked us out of our song. Our flesh has even held us back from humming a tune, and we've asked in the darkness, how can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? You say, I lost my job today. How shall I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? A loved one just passed away. How shall I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? A child has gone astray. How shall I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? My past has caught up with me. How shall I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I'm broken. I'm confused. I'm hopeless. I'm afraid. How can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So you've sat down and wept. You've traded an opportunity to sing for the option to sulk. We've all done that. We've all been there. Yes, Israel was exiled as a result of disobedience, but God had selected Israel. God had separated Israel. God had chosen Israel. God had taught and trained Israel to be the heralds to the nations of the goodness and the glory and the grace of God. They had every right to sing, even in captivity. They should have reminded themselves that they still had a song. What if, what if the children of Israel in Psalm 137 would have taken down those harps off the willows, tuned up the strings, and began to sing, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. In a strange land, yes, thou art with me. In my prison of suffering, yes, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over in my prison of captivity in my prison of suffering my cup really runs over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life just suppose if Israel had taken down those harps, tuned up the strings, and began to sing Psalm 95. The Bible says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Just suppose that the children of Israel had taken down their harps, tuned up their strings, and began to sing Psalm 91. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. He is my God in his him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. The children of Israel had a great hymn book to pull from. They could have dusted off those harps, got them off the willows, got off the river banks and started singing even in captivity. Sure, they could have picked some kind of psalm and let her rip, but they looked at their situation and they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Next time you're in a spiritual rut, 
and you find yourself sitting down and weeping by the waters of the world, you ought to grab a hymn book and you ought to turn to page 67 and begin to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. There is coming a day when no sorrow shall come, no more clouds in the skies, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore in that happy golden shore. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. We've all had long and weary days. Maybe you've had a rough week. Maybe you've had some discouraging months. Maybe you're empty and you're barren on the inside. You ought to take a hymn book and turn to page 70 once in a while and sing along with the songwriter who said, all times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair, but Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away, all tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse one glimpse, one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run that race till we see Christ. I know the devil gets on your back. The world laughs at you. Friends forsake you. Your past reminds you that you're not worth a dime. Fair enough. Dust off the harp and start singing to the Lord. The Lord wants to hear you sing. Get the hymn book out. It's under the blood. Oh, praise His dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life has been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding the devil it's under the blood. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Why should we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Isaiah 54, 1. Isaiah says, Sing, O barren, break forth into singing. The barren lady couldn't have any children. She would never have any children. She was mocked, and it was a picture of Israel. Sometimes it's a picture of us in our trials. And what do we do? You just have to break forth and sing anyway. Praise God anyhow. Lift up your voice and sing. The praising man prevails. If you're struggling with your lot in life tonight, if you're dissatisfied with how things are going, maybe you just need to sing past your plight. Sing in the storm. Sing in the trial. We can shout past our problems and see the potential of His promises. When we're in the prison of our suffering, we want to see the power of God takes praise from the believer. And that means faith. That means when you don't even see a way out, you just lift up your voice. You worship Him. You praise. You honor Him. You magnify Him. It doesn't matter how low you are. He's still on the throne. He's still high. The world doesn't understand the source of our song. The source of our song is not situational. It's not broken by a situation or a circumstance. And I sing when I'm happy, but I have a right to sing when I'm heavy. I sing when I'm happy. I like to be happy and sing. But I can sing when I'm heavy. Something about that lifts my spirit and helps my spirit move on. Circumstances change, but Christ never does. It doesn't matter if you're at home, you're at church, you're in familiar territory with like-minded people, or you're walking in a strange land. It doesn't matter if you're having a good day or a, a bad week. It doesn't matter if you have $100 in your pocket or if you're $100 in debt. The source of your song should not be wrapped up in situations or circumstances, favorable or unfavorable. The source of your song should still be there no matter what. Look up people like John Bunyan, Corey Ten Boom. The story they've done a movie on, they're about to do a follow-up, the unbroken story. Read about some of those stories of people in actual prisons that God did something with them and through them. Pilgrim's Progress was born out of John Bunyan's prison experience. Many of the Pauline epistles were born out of a prison experience. The prison of suffering gives us an opportunity to praise God and honor Him and see His power at work. The source of our song should not change no matter what happens and where we are. And our source of our song should not be silenced because we're in a strange land. You go over to Matthew 26, 30. Jesus, before he went into the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, the Bible says they sung a hymn. Jesus was singing before he went to the cross. I have no idea what he was singing. I have no idea what text they may have taken from the Psalms and sung. But prior to entering into the agonizing domain of Gethsemane, Jesus had a song on his heart. Walking down a hallway in the hospital, knowing that your loved one's about to pass away, Jesus gives songs in the night. Burdened at home because a child is rebelling and you don't know where they're at, 
Jesus gives songs in the night. Burden down because you don't know how you're going to pay the next bill or you just got a report about your health that you didn't want to hear. Jesus gives songs in the night. My song is Jesus. None other than the Savior. None other than Him. That's the supplication and the sound of my song. What the children of Israel in this text should have done and, or could have done is what Paul and Silas did in Acts chapter number 16. The most familiar story, I guess, it comes when somebody's in prison that breaks forth in praising and saw the power of God. The Bible says in Acts 16, 25 through 26, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Paul and Silas were in the will of God. They were preaching the gospel. They just saw a convert get born again. And because of that, they were thrown into a prison of suffering. But in the midst of that prison of suffering, the Bible says they begin to pray. They begin to sing praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Has it ever dawned on you what would happen if you stopped singing? If you give up your song, you say, I don't have a reason to sing. I'm in a prison of suffering. I, I, I'm going through so much in my life. I'm just going to stop singing to God. Your children need to hear you sing. Your husband and wife, they need to hear you sing. Your friends and neighbors and family, they need to still see a song on your heart. Don't give up. It might mean the salvation of somebody's soul because you sang in your prison of suffering. It might be somebody getting right with God because in your prison of suffering, you kept raising your hand. You kept serving God. One of the most convicting things I've ever seen in my entire life. A few years back, I saw a picture and a video online of a missionary in a foreign country, and it showed a man that had no fingers on his hands. No fingers on his hands. And he was singing in a congregation with his hand up, singing, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. And I thought, how many times with five good fingers, I don't even praise God. With ten good fingers, I don't even praise God. But there's a man in a foreign country that has no fingers on his hands, waving his hand up to God in a prison of suffering, saying, I'm going to praise God anyway because God wants to hear me sing. He's got more power on him than I ever have. God wants to hear us sing. The prisoners heard them. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I catch the sweet, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, Amen. how can I keep from singing through all the tumult and the strife? I hear that music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? What though my joys and my comforts die? I know my Savior liveth, Amen. what though the darkness gathers round, songs in the night he giveth, the peace of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain ever springing, all things are mine since I am his, how can I keep from singing, no storm can shake, my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth how can I keep from singing how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land how can we not how can we not after all that Jesus has done for us Our sins are washed away. Heaven is our home. The peace of God passes all understanding. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. How can I not sing? How can I not praise Him? 
How can I not worship Him? How can I not get on my knees and thank Him for loving somebody like me? How can I keep from singing? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open the Word of God tonight. Lord, I know sometimes the world steals our joy, our song. The devil tries to tell us there's no use in singing. There's no use in worshiping. There's no reason to praise. There's no reason to go to church. Lord, if we look back on all that you've done, how can we keep from singing? We have every right to sing when we're happy. We have every right to sing when we're heavy. So Lord, help us tonight not hang our hearts on the willows, to not sit down and weep and think that it's all over, even though we may be in a prison of suffering. Lord, help us to keep our praise so we can see the power of God. Bless us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.